Hello friends. So once again, welcome to my channel. And in this video, we'll discuss handling of multiple interrupt requests, right? So see, in the last to last video, we have discussed that on a common line, multiple devices are connected, right? Then how the processor will determine which device is requesting an interrupt. Hope you remember that last to last video's discussion. So see, whenever processor need to determine, because see, multiple devices are connected, first processor need to know that who has placed the request. Hope you remember that on a common line, multiple your devices were there. They are connected your via the open switches, right? These open switches were there. Via that, these are connected. Now see, whosoever places the request will close the switch. Then here the line will become active. Processor will see one interrupt request. Then in response to that, it need to execute the ISR. So first device processor has to know who has placed the request. To know that, what it will do, see, to know that we are going to use one method that is called as polling. What is done in polling is the processor will interrogate or processor will check one of the bit present in the status register of the device interface. We know with each device, one interface is there. In the interface, one status register is there. In the status register, one bit is there that is called as interrupt request bit. If the device has placed an interrupt, this bit will be one. If it has not placed, this bit will be zero. So what the processor will do, whenever it will see an interrupt request is coming and there are multiple sources of interrupt is there, then what it will do, it will uh, see the status register of the devices serially. And for whichever device, it will find this bit to be one. For that device, processor will start the interrupt service routine, right? So that only I was telling when a pro interrupt request is received, it is necessary to identify the particular device that has placed the request, right? The information needed to determine whether the device is requesting an interrupt is available in the status register of the particular device. When a device raises an interrupt request, it sets one of the bits in its status register to one. Okay? And the simplest way to identify the interrupting device is to is to have the ISR poll all the devices connected to the bus. First, we'll see who has placed the request. The first device encountered with his IRQ bit set is the device that should be serviced, right? So see, the method is very good. The method is also easy to implement, right? But what is the disadvantage? The disadvantage is that in the beginning, we are interrogating each of the device status register, right? Whereas some of them have not placed the request. Unnecessarily, we are checking them. And thereby, we are wasting our CPU cycles also. The main drawback is the time spent in interrogating the IRQ bits of all the devices that may not be requesting any service. So thereby, we will be wasting our CPU cycles in interrogating the IRQ bits of the devices connected to the common line. Right. Then, uh, to remove this disadvantage, the other method is the device who has placed the request will identify itself. Suppose one method is someone has placed a query in the class group, right? And sub, uh, in the class group and has not identified that who has placed the request. Then first the teacher will ask each of the students whether you have placed the request, whether you have placed the request. And then the processor will reply to the particular person, right? Now the point is, in this, the process, professor is uh, wasting his time or her time in asking each of the students. So instead of asking on a common group, the device that places the request, the, uh, the person who is asking the question will also identify himself or herself. Will say, I'm roll number so and so, and this is my query then the professor can reply to the student directly, right? So that is the case. So here, the solution to my polling method, though it is easier one, the solution to polling method will be the device that places the request will identify itself. How it is going to do? By using your vector interrupt method, right? So vector interrupt method, that next we are going to see. 
in this method actually what is done the device that places the request will put one code on the beta bus right suppose the code it has placed is 0d8 that means it is a 8 bit number 0 means 4 zeros 8 means 1 3 zero it is in a hexadecimal 4 bit uh, sorry 8 bit uh, number it has placed on the data bus this number will be manipulated and will be used as a index in some table in the memory right and in the memory at this index we will get the starting address of my isr right isr's starting address i'll get so here in case of vector interrupt method the device will identify itself as well as that will help me to get the starting address of my isr see till now whatever we have seen or whatever i have discussed what i used to say processor has received one int here it will do some miscellaneous tasks in between then it will start the isr what is isr interrupt service routine is a set of instructions right and where do i get instructions whenever i am executing it will be in the memory which memory main memory and suppose say your memory is of your suppose one megabyte one megabyte so how many locations are there 2 to the power 20 locations are there so in this 2 to the power 20 big number right where will i get my isr i need to know then only i can execute it so many devices are there each of them require different different service so their isr will be also there in memory so where is my isr that is there in the vector interrupt method we can find out so after finding it out we will go to the particular isr suppose this is my isr's beginning i'll go and i will execute right so this is actually in summary i have told so in and again we'll see so the point is given that different devices are likely to require different interrupt service so how can the processor obtain the starting address of the appropriate routine in each case device one requires different thing device two requires another thing so i need to execute different different isrs so how do i know which isr i am going to execute right so see the solution is vector interrupt the solution says to reduce the time involved in the polling process a device requesting an interrupt may identify itself directly to the processor it will tell yes i have placed the request then the processor can immediately start executing the corresponding isr see it will identify itself that will help me to get the index in the table and from the table i'll get the starting address of my isr so i can start immediately executing the isr the device requesting an interrupt can identify itself if it has own interrupt request because suppose for multiple students multiple uh, numbers are there so looking at the number i can find out i mean different different ways are there suppose then looking at that i can find out another one is the person who is placing the request will give me one number by that number i will find out what to execute for this device this number will be manipulated to use as an index in the memory at that address i'll get the starting address of my isr and then we can start execution now see a commonly used scheme is to allocate see what is done is the commonly used method is in the memory one particular area is reserved for storing the addresses of isrs right isr means interrupt service routine and this area where we store the starting address of isr that part of memory is called as interrupt vector table so whenever the device places and requests it will give me one number that number will be manipulated and will be used as an index in this table where i will get the address of my isr that is the technique very beautiful technique see a commonly used scheme is to allocate permanently an area in the memory to hold the addresses of interrupt service routines these addresses are usually referred to as interrupt vectors and they are said to constitute the interrupt vector table. Next is when an interrupt request arrives, the information provided by the requesting device is used as a pointer into the interrupt vector table. And the address in the corresponding interrupt vector 
is automatically loaded into the program counter. So once I get the address of ISR in my program counter, what I will execute next? That particular instruction I will execute next. And that instruction means it is the very first instruction of your interrupt service routine. This is how the control moves to your ISR. Right? So see, all this working is understood. How the interrupt vector method works. Now see, whenever we are using it, we need to take care of some points. What are those? Let me tell you. So see, IO device sent interrupt vector code over the data bus. That I was telling, the device that places the request will also identify itself by placing a code that we used to call as vector code, where it will place over the data bus. Right? Now see, that time processor was executing some program. Suppose it was executing one instruction I. That was suppose add, suppose that instruction at memory location I it was executing, it was add R1, comma A. Then what will happen? After the addition process, result will be stored in A, right? To store the result in address A, it requires what? The use of address bus. Suppose it was just performing the ALU's addition operation. Result is yet to store. That time we got the interrupt request with the vector code. Then what will happen? To store the result, it will use the data bus where it will place the data, right? Whatever the result of addition on the data bus. And the device has already placed the vector code. Its part is also over. And whenever I will, means the, this result will be yeah, put on this data bus, this vector code will be vanished, right? Then to not to happen all this kind of situation, what is done? The device that places the request, first it will see whether the processor is ready to accept the vector code. If it is so, then only it, it places the vector code on the data bus, else it will not. The point is, see, when a device sends an interrupt request, the processor may, may not be ready to receive the interrupt vector code. The example that I said, interrupt is disabled by the processor at that moment or the data bus may be used by the processor to complete the execution of the current instruction. Any of the situations can be there. So, after place, first the device will place only the interrupt request, INTR. If the processor is in a situation to accept this, then processor will reply by sending another pulse. That is called as interrupt acknowledgement. After the device will see this signal, it will understand, okay, processor is processor is going to take my request. Then only the device, device will place the vector code over the data bus, right? So, so when the processor is ready to receive, then only, so when the processor is ready to receive the interrupt vector code, it sends the INT signal to the device. So only after receiving this signal, device will place the vector code, then only the operation will be performed correctly, right? So this much is there for vector interrupt method. And see, one more thing, over a single line also, many devices can place the request, right? So many devices may place the request over the single line. Then first processor will decide whom it is going to give the INTA pulse, right? Then whosoever receives the INTA pulse, that device is going to place the code on the data bus and then processor will index it in the vector table and will get the starting address of the particular device interrupt service routine. So this how it works. So this much is there for your vector interrupt method. This is one of the very interesting topic in our IO chapter. Hope you have understood by my explanations. And if it is so, then please do not forget to like my videos and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.